Welcome to the show, everyone. Today's guest is Zoe Cher. Now, Zoe and I had never met before actually hopping on to do this interview, but we were introduced by a mutual connection, somebody that we both respect greatly. And Zoe is the now owner of a publication called Daddy's Digest. And this, I say now owner because she just recently acquired this this platform, this publication, a handful of months ago. She also just recently had a baby, like eight weeks ago. And what we talked about was, you know, what what was her why to wanting to go down this path of owning and, and ultimately using a publication like this to be able to create a space for dads and men to be able to search for answers to how to become a better dad, how to navigate this world as a dad. And then, of course, all the other aspects that go with that, from mental health to, you know, how to really come to terms with the idea of, you know, if you are very business-minded and an entrepreneur, how do you balance that with being a responsible and an intentional father? We talked a bit about relationships as well and the dynamic that's created. I know both of us used examples of our own personal relationships and how, you know, both of us are very driven and as is my wife. And she shared with me that her husband's also an entrepreneur too. So it was really interesting to have that conversation of, you know, with somebody that really gets kind of what we're both going through and have have these visions and goals that are so great to serve and support the men out there and the dads that are out there. And at the same time, still consciously wanting to be the best version of themselves for their kids and to create that quality time. And uh, yeah, it was just such an insightful conversation to really understand a little bit more about Zoe and what her motivation was for going down this path. She's got a really interesting background that's got her to this point. And there was a whole bunch of takeaways with regards to ways that we may even be able to collaborate in the future, which I have no doubt that we will. But, you know, this is somebody that I want to introduce you to, and especially for all the dads out there like me, because there isn't a lot of places you can turn to when you search Google and you look for the answer to some of the toughest questions that we have. Like, you know, how do I have a conversation with my kids about sex? How do I have a conversation with my friend who has a kid that just came out and said that they were gay or that they're a male, but now they're a female? Like some of these conversations that can be very uncomfortable and that quite frankly, men usually just don't talk about, right? They keep it bottled up. They don't look for the answers. They kind of go back to the old school way of, well, I'll just figure it out on my own. And, you know, real men don't cry and vulnerability is weakness instead of strength and that kind of thing. It's We're challenging these concepts and what she has with the Daddy's Digest, I think is a really powerful platform to be able to empower men with those kind of conversations and to find those answers. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's go ahead and give it a listen. Welcome to the Trevor Turnbull Show, Zoe. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah, so we were just getting to know each other for four minutes before we hopped on here because we've never actually met before. <laughs> but we have a mutual uh, connection in Ron Tight who uh, I didn't even actually explain to you. I met Ron like five years ago. We were both speaking at the same engagement in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is where I'm from. And I just have a lot of mutual respect for him as a speaker, a, a, you know, a person, a business leader. And then, of course, now as a dad, he's got two young kids. And we were kind of joking around at, as to like, hey, we're, we're older dads. And he's like, oh, I'm a really older, older dad, right? Because I think he's like early 50s type thing. But... You know, I'm in my mid 40s. I've got a three year old and a four year old, uh, three and four year old boys. And I know you have two kids as well, and just had a baby. Congratulations! Yeah, I just had a baby. I'm in my I'm in my early 30s. Yeah. Um, and I have a three and a half year old and a two month old. Wow. Yeah. Boys, girls. So right. Right in it. Uh, my daughter is three and a half, and my son is two months old. Okay, so you got one of each then. That's one nice. of each. Yeah. Uh, what is they? What do they say? The million dollar family. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Well, that um, is obviously something we'll chat about too as a part of this conversation. But like I was saying to you when we first uh, hopped on here. The inspiration really for doing this podcast is to just have great conversations with people that have interesting stories to tell 
and, you know, create a space to be able to just speak the truth about life and business and parenthood and everything in between. And so that's the framing. And if we were to kind of, you know, for the little bit that I know about you, I was introduced to you because you just recently acquired a daddy blog, which was a unique thing for a mom and a woman to do. So you want to maybe just speak to that and and kind of tell me the backstory as to why why did you do that? <laughs> yeah, why did I do that? Uh, so many reasons. I, I'm going to rewind a little um, because I think context really helps. I started my journey as a kindergarten teacher. So phase one, version one of Zoe uh, was really focused on education and helping kids to learn. And it, it was really what I was working toward my whole life. And then once I achieved it and had my own classroom, I was really unhappy. And I went to business school after that. And it was a big departure and people were very confused by it. And frankly, I was very confused by myself. Like, what, what, am, I, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> what do I want to be when I grow up? Yeah. Exactly. It was really like early 20s. I thought I knew who I was. And then, it, no, I did not. And didn't want to be a corporate sellout. Really cared about social impact and was doing this business program. And what was unique about my business program was it was an entrepreneur stream and it allowed us to work with other businesses in order to get our course credit. So I found myself falling in love actually with listening to people pitch their businesses and me being like, have you actually spoken to a person about this idea? Is this like you're spending all this money building a prototype and no one's actually interested. Uh, so I, I really, you know, it was just, I was skeptical of it. I thought, you know, startup life was hyped up and a bit silly. And I just found myself, you know, wedging my way into all these different businesses. At the end of the school year, I said, who wants to pay me to keep helping you? And that was the beginning of my marketing agency. So I started the agency seven years ago and A year ago, which was in the middle of the pandemic, I wrote a children's book called ABC Stay Home With Me. Um, I co-authored it with Gabriella Rakoff, and all the proceeds of the book went to frontline workers. And in the context of this journey, I felt like I was right back to where I started. My love of books, my love of children's education, and of people connecting. And I felt so connected to my why. And then I looked at the agency and I looked at our favorite, you know, most successful customers and they were mostly in the parenting or family space. You know, there was a family values drive behind those customers. And one of the people who purchased my book uh, was, uh, is a fellow named Vikram. He's is he is a person still. Um, <laughs> anyway, he has a, a four-year-old and he read the book to her and loved it. And we became very quick friends and he had started Daddy's Digest. And I actually didn't notice anything about Daddy's Digest for the first six months of our friendship. Like it was, it was on, like, I didn't, I was just talking to him about kids and life and whatever. And He didn't bring it up. He's a very humble guy. And when I finally noticed it one day, essentially, long story short, he said, well, you're so passionate about it. Don't just help me with it. Just buy it. And I was like, what? (laughs) Uh, So that's what led to the acquisition conversation. And, you know, I've talked about this a little bit on my social media, but for me as a woman, Acquiring a dad brand was important to me for a few reasons. One, I think the woman's blog market is oversaturated. From a business perspective, I think it's a very interesting and compelling move. Two, my husband wants to support me. My dad wants to support me. It's not just the women who are looking things up about how to help their kids or how to help their parents, help help their wives or their partners uh, become become, you know, more confident. They want to do it too. So 
I'll give you a, for instance, my husband will often say, don't look it up. Don't Google it, Zoe, because you're going to fall down into a vortex of judgment. And I want to protect you from that. And then he looks it up for me and it takes him to a pink, a pink blog. So it's a problem. It's actually a problem because men are looking for answers to questions that are deep and sensitive and challenging. And it takes them to a women's site that continues the narrative about a man needing to play a particular role in society. And that means that women and children won't be able to change or progress if we don't allow men to have access to those emotional things. Anyway, that's just touching the surface of it, but I'm very passionate about it and the change it can have. That's amazing. The uh, I'm actually a part of a, a mentorship Monday is what it's called. There's a couple of guys that started it up and it's literally just a Monday night call open for anybody that wants to show up. It's just kind of like invitation invites your other guy friends type thing. And it's a space for guys to just come and just be, you know, and to talk about what they're going through from all aspects of life. You've got parents there. You've got people that have grandkids. You've got people with no kids that are going through, you know, identity crisis and financial challenges and, you know, and a lot of really positive things that get shared too. But man, there's just something about the space that's created there um, where there isn't a stigma behind it of like exclusivity of like, well, this is for the guys. Well, how could you possibly create just a guy's space to talk about your mental health? But man, it's, it just feels different. You know, it just feels well, it's different. interesting because I find so much of what we do as adults is to an extent performative. And then, you know, the pandemic really stripped that all away. We can't perform in these ways because now what's going on behind us is different. And that is a kid popping out on the side or, you know, someone has a positive COVID test in your family and it's just changed how you show up at work the next day. I mean, look, these, these types of issues were happening well before the pandemic, but it's really, you know, the pimple is going to pop at some point. Right. And I think that's really how I feel about this is that people want to talk about what they're going through. They don't want to feel like they have to perform put on a show to fit a certain mold. They want to be themselves. And not only that, I, I think I think that it's, it's not going to change ever, anything if we just keep men's clubs the same. It's great. You want to have a cigar. You want to go to your man cave. You want to watch sports. You want to, you know, I don't want to, you know, shoot the whatever. I'm not going to say the swear word on your podcast, but. <laughs> oh, it's totally fine. fine. <laughs> we Okay. So, but the point is, is that we, sure, I want to have pink sh- champagne and chocolates sometimes. Fine. But do I also want to have a cigar and a beer sometimes? Maybe. There you go. Like, it, it's just this, it's this notion that a man's event has to be a certain way or a woman's event has to be a certain way. Well, there's things that we all need to talk about. <laughs> and I think parenting is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing that comes to mind too, and like I, like we said at the start, like we're just getting to know each other, but there's so many synergies and light bulbs going off here. But my wife and I are both 15 years as entrepreneurs. We've very much had our identities in the past kind of grounded in entrepreneurship and just resilience of like pushing through. And you were telling the story about being a part of these, these uh, classes where you were like judging ideas and stuff. That was my inspiration to get into entrepreneurship. I did a class um, way back in 2002 at the University of Saskatchewan where it was an entrepreneurship class. And it was literally come up with an idea, market it, and sell it. And I remember I took like 40 classes in university, and that's the only one I remember, you know? But anyways, I'm kind of going off the rails here. But my wife and I both come from that world, right, where our identity and our passion is really around business and then we wanted to be parents, and we we actually had some struggles along the way. We lost two kids at 19 months and 22 months in preterm birth, and I actually just got done an interview right before we hopped on here with this one, talking with a friend about the guilt and the shame that I had at that time about um, having those losses and actually feeling somewhat relieved. And it was a really, really tough thing to go through because I felt like just an asshole. Like I felt like a total jerk for thinking that way. And it took a lot of personal work to really like lean into the idea that like I wasn't ready 
then. And I was just admitting it to myself. And then now we have these two beautiful boys and we both still very much like to do what we do like this right here. Like I like to hop on podcasts and have good conversations. And when I do that versus say spending time with my kids, it doesn't make me a bad dad. I'm actually creating something here to hopefully inspire my kids in the future, you know? You're but, preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah. But so this kind of stuff, and that's that's how I see Daddy's Digest, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, it's an extension of this feeling that you already have inside and you're living already. You just want to be able to create a space for other people to have these conversations, to share yeah. these ideas. It's a huge responsibility because, again, it's not my story. But if I can make space for people's stories and say, hey, I'm reaching out to start a conversation, you know, the question, you know, one of the things I want to do, and I'm probably going to do it, I don't know, tomorrow or not tomorrow, it's the weekend tomorrow, on Monday, boundaries, boundaries. Boundaries, um, yes. Uh, but is to make a, a private, like an anonymous question box because, you know, as I talk to more men and someone said, you know, my friend's son just came out as a woman. I actually don't know what to say to my friend. So you start thinking like, here's this person who wants to support his friend, doesn't know what to do or say, goes to Google to type in, how do I support my friend whose son is now a woman? And what are they going to find? I want them to find Daddy's Digest. And I am honored to have the opportunity to do that. Like it, it feels like, Feels like a huge responsibility, a huge challenge, um, but nothing changes until there's something there to allow people to start changing, right? Someone has to be willing to go there. And I think that my the, the founder of Daddy's Digest was willing to do that. And now it's my job, which is such an interesting thing as an entrepreneur to acquire something as opposed to start it yourself. It's my job to continue fueling that passion. Um, and to relate to what you were saying about being an entrepreneur and having kids, you know, I had a baby two months ago and I'm working full time and people don't understand, right? Like even you just sort of, there was a little bit of a, wow. Um, and it's not a bad thing. I don't, I don't mind that reaction in a, in a way, in a way I'm sort of like, yeah, that's right. I'm awesome. Um, but to be, to be candid, it's not really if I'm awesome or not awesome or capable or not capable. This decision to work full time is what's best for me, which means that I show up as the best version from, of myself for my children. So doing the work in therapy to understand who I am, how I best show up as a parent, and the example that I want to set as a mother, that's the work I have to do. So showing up for yourself and then showing up for your kids, that is, to me, part of the journey that I want to be able to open up for others as well. Absolutely. I feel like we're pretty well aligned on that one. And, you know, my wife's very, very much um, the same kind of energy and and thinking, way of thinking as you are too. You know, like she, she just loves what she does for work. And there's no doubt that at times she, like, if I could speak from the context of what your, the like Daddy's Digest is all about... I see her judge herself because we're always hardest on ourselves, unfortunately. And, you know, but it's always from that context of like, am I a good mom? Am I a bad mom? Like, wh and what is, who defines that? And obviously the answer is you do as the individual. You, you choose whether or not you will put yourself down and say that you're not doing a good enough job. But naturally from my seat though, as a dad and a husband, I think, how can I support her to say, this is okay for you to be like this. And in fact, I actually like love it about you, you know? Like I don't want a wife that just wants to be a stay-at-home mom and not do any, like I don't want it to sound well, derogatory, you, but. Okay, but no, that's the challenge. How do you say it in the right way because of what exists, right? So I, I feel you on that. If a woman wants to be a stay-at-home mom, power to her. I, what, if that's what makes her happy, and she has a choice, amazing. Same with a dad. But I feel you because my husband, someone will say to me, oh, you're so lucky that your husband understands and appreciates you. And I'm like, well, he better. Like, well, I don't understand. What do you mean? I, like, I do understand. If I step outside myself and look at the way society is, I do understand what they're saying. 
Do I react well to it? No, I say, I wouldn't have married him otherwise if he didn't accept and celebrate who I am as an individual. And that's one badass chick. And that doesn't emasculate him. That does, in fact, I think he's a stronger man because he deals with me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just say it. quotes there, right? Not only is he, uh, I think, lucky that he's my partner, but I'm lucky he's mine. But it's mutual. It's not, it's not, oh, wow, you're so lucky you found a man who is willing to stay with his kids when you go to a work event. We're his kids. <laughs> well, and obviously you're speaking kind of to, I'm sure, what a lot of the topics of your content is, and maybe we can get into that, but like, you know, even this men's group that I'm in on a Monday night, there's people that are in there that are on the completely opposite spectrum of me, for example, where their wives don't work and they are the person that brings home the financials, the money. And like one of them just recently lost his job and he's in this um, total state of flux right now trying to figure out how to navigate being his true authentic self and following his passions, but knowing that he has this responsibility in this relationship and in this family to actually provide financially, you know? And there's no perfect answer. The answer is always just, well, take the leap and surround yourself with good people that can help guide you and make sure that you don't freak out at every turn because that's that's the lessons I've learned as an entrepreneur is like, you know, I've hit rock bottom a dozen times and every time I thought that that was rock bottom and then there was something else. <laughs> and that's I always know I get up. I'm really interested in exploring that as an entrepreneur as well. You know, this happened, now what? Is something I really want to explore with Daddy's Digest because there's all these different things that happen. You know, my wife just gave birth, now what? I just lost my job, now what? I'm starting a company, now what? And and again, yes, it's from the lens of a man and a father in this case, but just imagine, that's the point of Daddy's Digest. It's not Zoe's Digest. Forget my agenda. I, I, I set a mission as a CEO, but it's the voices, the dads, the voices of the dads who contribute the content. It's their digest. So it's, that's, that's the point, is that I will let the content lead the journey I go on. All I know is that making being a dad the coolest thing so that we can treat each other with more kindness and, you know, ideally get more parenting courses for more parents, dads in particular, if possible, but in, in areas that don't have the resources to get those types of parenting courses. I like, that's what I stand for is how can I get more education to more young, not young, but like young parents, new parents. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like if someone had told a whole bunch, let's just say there's a hundred dads and 50 of them suck and 50 of them are awesome. If someone had just told all hundred of them, here are some parenting basics, you know, here's some therapy, <laughs> here's some, some homework to do on yourself before the baby's born and like walk them through it. How would that change things for children? Like it, it gives me chills to think about that I can be a part of doing that. Yeah, that's what I want to be doing. Like, that's my mission. This is way bigger than me. This is way, way bigger than me. And I'm, I truly feel like I've come full circle back to Zoe in her early 20s thinking, I'm going to change the world with my classroom, which is still a beautiful thought. And teachers are amazing, hardworking. Honestly, I think it's harder than entrepreneurship because it's a lot less celebrated um, so go teachers go, but yeah, I, I feel like the best version of myself. I just had a baby two months ago. People go ahead and judge me, call me crazy. I don't care because I know what I need to do with my life. And it's an honor. Like it blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can tell, you can hear it in your voice, the, the passion around it and there's always a lot of grounding conversations that I have in all aspects of what I do every day. But, you know, I keep referencing this men's group because it's just so relevant to like what we're talking about. But there's also uh, just recently came up into my world um, the topic of, uh, you know, if you have a daughter, for example, and you find 
you know, the, the, the dad finds that he doesn't like anybody that my daughter dates, you know? And I had this conversation with this person the other day, who is the wife of that guy, saying that, well, you know that, like, daughters go and find their dads in their relationship, or at least there's just elements of attraction there, right? So, like, however you show up, is what they're going to attract into their world. So if they're closed off emotionally, that's what your daughter will go and find for a partner, you know? If they see somebody that's confident and loving and accepting and vulnerable and willing to cry and just all the aspects that typically are not associated with masculinity and being a man and stuff, then, you know, it just seems so obvious, right, on the outside. And, And I think to get back to what you were saying, though, it's like, with the information that's available at our fingertips now and your vision of wanting to pull all those pieces together to like create a place where like, here's where you can come and ask the question anonymously and find the answer and find a community of people that are asking similar questions. So you, so you can say, I'm not crazy. It's actually something other people are asking. It's such a powerful thing, right? Because it creates the space for people to go and explore that as opposed to the stigmas of what it means to be a man or So a this dad. is what's the, like the most, and you'll appreciate this, one of the most fascinating things about, you know, so Daddy's Digest has about a million followers. So the data is really, really interesting. Yeah, and growing. So it's very exciting. And uh, you can imagine as someone who run, has been running a marketing agency for seven years, I... Immediately, I'm like, I want to go look at the Google Analytics. <laughs> what is <laughs> happening back here? Let's connect the dots here. Well, and to sort of say, like, what are certain people searching for anonymously on Google, right? Like, what is the question you're typing in on Google that you don't want people to know about versus what are you typing in on Facebook and clicking like on when it shows up in your organic news feed or on Instagram, right? So you might like five things to barbecue, But you might be typing in, I'm not sure how to tell my wife, blah, 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 right? I'm not going to say what the most searched for things on Daddy's Digest, but my goodness, it is a fascinating insight into how the narrative needs to change. Like, what is the most searched article and keyword? It has to do with cheating. No kidding, hey? Hmm. So it's, it's upsetting. And it's an opportunity. And it's also saying, if people are looking for stuff about cheating, we have to create resources that help them explore those feelings so that they can deal with those feelings in a healthy way rather than just in a destructive way, right? Like, if, if that's what they're searching for privately, what does that mean for those families? And what responsibility do I have as the CEO it's, it's, they're, it's really, they're big questions and, and I'm, oh, I'm so up for it. (laughs) Yeah. So obviously this is fairly new in you acquiring this and you have a marketing mind. So you're into all the analytics and the data and everything else, but who's contributing to this and how are you attracting, um, people to contribute to it? Cause obviously it's not just you writing the content, right? Oh, I don't write anything. I, I mean, maybe an article once in a while. But um, yes, there's around 110 contributors who submit articles. And then since the acquisition, I would say I get three to five articles submitted per week. You know, different types of people, different types of uh, things that they want to have published. And then there's all the inquiries from the PR firms. So it's totally like it's a totally new world for me. Um, Also in terms of like, okay, what were the guidelines about what content would be a yes, a no, or, uh, and you know, never. Yeah. <laughs> like a yes, I'm maybe. I'm sure you get all across the spectrum on that too. <laughs> I really do. And the no is always to do with anything advertorial. So even if it's a, even if it's a sponsored content piece or a brand wants to talk about, um, what they're doing, they have to add value first. And again, even in terms of sponsorships and how I want to run the thing. I, so I acquired Daddy's Digest about a month and a half before I gave birth. So it's really been not that long. It's been three and a half months. Yeah. So, or maybe four. Who knows what time is anymore? <laughs> is the sun out? Yes. Okay, it's daytime. Yeah, no, it's, it's raining here. Um, so I think that, you know, to say 
giving back is a vital part of this revenue structure and knowing that I'm not going to work with a brand who isn't aligned with the fact that what they're producing is supposed to help serve this mission. And then this mission, like part of their money will be going to serve this mission. I will not work with a sponsor who's not aligned with that. So probably I'm going to have to put together some sort of like group of people to help me make those decisions. Cause who am I to decide what's right and what's wrong? Um, I need help with that for sure. That was the first thing that came to mind too. And it's a, uh... It's a massive opportunity, obviously, of a world that's filled with so much information now. And then, of course, as we become more able to search anything and then fake news comes into the whole play and stuff, people have a tough time knowing who to trust, right? And that's the first thing that comes to mind is, like, the brand, right? It's like it's – this is just two marketers talking now (laughs) because that – because I've actually owned quite a few um, publication properties in the past before too. One that was in the like sports recruiting world, helping people get jobs in the sports industry. I had a networking blog um, called Networking in Vancouver that we operated for like eight years and then just kind of let it tail off because we just didn't have a passion for it anymore. But I very much understand that dynamic of like wanting to get very reputable sources and quality information, but then also knowing that like, well, who am I to be the judge of that? You know, maybe the public should be the one to judge that. And yeah, yeah, I'm not the core values police. Yeah, <laughs> but I would say that what I do have going for me is that I care about core values and I try and lead with it. So, to at least as a starting place, to say, what are your company's core values? How do you try to embody those? you know, show me an example, because I don't want to just become a publication that's a checkbox for a company or an individual. Oh, I was published on Daddy's Digest, so I have good values. And let's, I mean, like that is a whole other can of worms about how, how marketing and corporate social responsibility are so closely tied together and often done so poorly. And just to, check something off a list. So like I, I really, in, in terms of creating real impact, I will need, you know, a board of advisors and I will need guidance um, because, you know, got to know what you don't know and ask for help. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If your vision is ultimately to create impact, then there's a lot of pieces to that. And there it's, you know, I don't want to even say fortunate, like you intentionally put yourself in this position to understand marketing and come from a background of childhood developments. And it's funny you say that because I was on the six-year program for my marketing degree, which basically meant that I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do for two years. So I went into elementary education for a year and then went like, well, I don't really want to be a teacher. So, okay, I'll go into business. I'm like, what does this even mean exactly? And then like four years later, I was trying to, I was finally, you know, I discovered the entrepreneurship class and I was like, Ooh, maybe that's it. You know, 60 grand later and a degree that I never really used, but it's a good skill to have, I guess, is what I'm saying is to understand the dynamics of all of this stuff and even human psychology too. You oh know? my, like I, I am so grateful for my three degrees. I have the English degree, the teaching degree and the master's in business. And I use every single one of them every day. And I, I remember in my master's program, there was a negotiation course and they were like, wow, Zoe, you always come out with such a great result. And I'm like, well, try teaching 21, three and four year olds for a year. <laughs> like it's your adults who are at least, I mean, look, some adults behave like three and four year olds, let's be honest. But all you have to do is listen and critically problem solve. Just listen, 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 right? And I think that's why I'm so excited because books, reading for me was like my escape always. It still is. And now I get to help create that as a way for other people. Like, it's just, oh, I'm just so excited. It's You're such in a your good, bliss. It's such a, it's such a, and like my little baby is so cute. And my daughter is such a great big sister. And my husband's so lovely. And the business is so interesting. Like, it's just, it's just so great. And I just want to pull all the positive vibes together and make more good things happen. 
Well, those are always the best entrepreneurial ventures where you actually love what you're doing. (laughs) If you could show up every day amidst all the chaos that is the day-to-day life as a parent and in business and things break all the time and they will again, you know? Oh yeah, I say all of this and then I think to myself, oh my gosh, it's about to be a weekend with two kids. Right. What am I going to do? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like I adore my kids and I, I I love spending time with them. And one day maybe you'll listen to this children of mine and, and you'll say, my gosh, my mom is always working, but I want to show up for them so much when I'm there. And so I'm busy thinking to myself like, okay, I got to get the shaving cream out and the food coloring. Then we got to bake. Like I, I want it to be, I, I don't want to over-program my children or my life, but I'm also like when I'm there, I want it to be rich and beautiful and colorful. So I had to gear down Zoe at work and gear up Zoe as a mom. And I feel like a lot of parents relate to that. And may just don't say it out loud. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm so glad you addressed your kids there too. Because again, that's another piece of this is like, I want both of our kids watching this later and being like, right. they were pretty cool, you know? And they were a little ahead of their time even too, you know? Trying to create actual impact, you know, instead of following the norm. Yeah, I like to, I like to think that, like, I also like to think to myself, oh my gosh, they're going to hate me because then I'm going <laughs> to have set these unrealistic standards about how much a person can do in a day. And I don't want them to feel judged if they don't epically fill their day as I do. They can do whatever they want. Maybe they just want to wander and float and paint. And like, I just have this energy that won't stop, but they can be whatever they want to be. You guys can be whatever you want to be. There you go. And it's funny you say that though, too, because in the same context of your daddy's digest and like the question that would pop into somebody like my head would be, how do I empower my kids to want to be entrepreneurs and not get a job? Like, that's literally something I would Google search. (laughs) And intuitively, (laughs) yeah, and you know what? Like, I've got 10 different ways that I would navigate that and am currently, you know? Like, my wife and I are on a fast track right now to move to Costa Rica because we know that, like, we've spent 15 years in this space where everybody just was thrown into digital and Zoom meetings. Like, we... We joke around about the fact that we prepared for COVID 15 years ago, you know? <laughs> and, you know, it's not to undermine the the horrible aspects of what's gone on with all of this, but it's just to say that, like, okay, the world just cracked wide open. Information is everywhere. It's not an issue now to hire somebody overseas and feel like you're taking jobs away. It's literally like there's a shift happening that... If you want to be exceptional at what you do and make top dollar and all that, then be exceptional at what you do because there's people in the world that can do it just as good as you that now you can hire them and typically at a lower rate even too, but they still maintain a really high standard of living. Anyways, I'm kind of side railing on that, but that's the kind of question that comes up for me. You know, it's like, how do I create an environment for my kids so that they don't hate entrepreneurship because they see me and they're like, I never want to be like you, dad. But these are the kind of things that go through my head, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, it goes back to how you show up based on how you use your energy in the day. And that impacts their entire life. It's crazy. I have so many ideas. We'll talk about it after the podcast. Yes, absolutely. Oh, oh, I love it. It's, it's been (laughs) so fun talking. (laughs) Yeah. So I've got uh, one final piece to this interview here. I call it the the one thing uh, lightning round, I guess you'd call it. So this book, I hold it up. The one thing book is something that's, it's just been very instrumental for me in the last couple of years in particular um, around just focus and like, you know, really being intentional about everything that we do. So I've got a few specific questions that are around the one thing. So feel free to elaborate on these as, as much as you want here. There's no time limit on it, I guess you'd say. Okay, so first question, uh, who is the one person or mentor that you would say has been the most influential in your life, all time? You can go as far back as childhood if you'd like. Mm, My grandfather um, was a Holocaust survivor and the original entrepreneur of the family. Uh, He uh, left Nazi Germany when he was uh, nine years old and then was on his own in Uh, England after the war. And basically my favorite story about my grandfather, actually I have so many, but one of my favorite stories um, was that 
so he was 14 when this when about this story and he created his own supply and demand so he went in um as a little boy wearing shorts and a t-shirt um and a little cap and said hi toy store do you sell bows and arrows and they were like no we don't and then like two weeks later he comes back with a full beard full suit selling bows and arrows <laughs> <laughs> so market that research business, before you know, market research is it. wow so he went in there and he created the demand and then he supplied them and um that was my grandfather he he reinvented himself and you know moved across the world with his three daughters and started a fashion company ran it successfully for 25 years sold it and ended up becoming an immigration consultant trying to help other immigrants come to Canada and um yeah he passed away about a year and a half ago and my son is named after him wow that's cool um, sorry to hear about your loss, but he sounded like a pretty amazing man. And he obviously lived great, he lived a great life. He really yeah. did a great long life. I wouldn't say everything about his life was great. He lost a lot in his life and he looked for answers for a very long time. Um, but he's a fighter and a survivor and he gave that to us. Yeah. I was just going to say it's you, you model after what you see, right, in your life and what you've what you're raised around. And obviously there's a lot of pieces of him that I'm sure you see in yourself and the way that's in your drive right now. I would consider myself very lucky to emulate him. Yeah. Who is one person or mentor that is most influential in your life right now? I don't know how to answer that question. Um, the pandemic has been so strange in terms of knowing who to turn to um, and who to trust. And like, there's a few different answers coming to my mind. One would be like myself. It sounds kind of maybe full of egotistical, but like turning inward and saying like, trust your instincts, you know, understand who you need to surround yourself with and make those decisions consciously, even if it's fewer people, you know, advocate for yourself, giving birth, getting a night nurse, you know, going back to work, not going back to work, listening to my body, right? Like all of those things, I've worked so hard on myself to, to be someone that I can trust. Does that make any sense? That totally makes sense. This is why I love this part of the interviews that I do because the answers are so all over the place and there's no wrong answer, you know? It's like- I just don't want to sound like a jerk who's like, oh, no, myself. I, yeah, I don't see that at, at all. Like if I can frame it with what I heard, it's you have taken the time to understand who you are and to trust yourself and to forgive yourself even if you make mistakes and to keep moving forward. And that in itself, like- Looking inward is um, most people don't do it. Most people don't do it. So when they look for a mentor or a coach or something, they think somebody else can come in and fix them or change something. But the most impactful thing you can do is is work on yourself and well, be when you the mentor. The, question, the first thing that came up was my therapist. But when I think my therapist, it's me. Like someone just asks the questions and then I'm the one that does the work, right? You do the so, work. Yeah. You either show up for yourself or you don't. There you go. I love it. Next question. What is one philanthropic cause that means the most to you and why? That's another impossible one and it's something I'm grappling with right now because frankly, I think I want to start my own charity <laughs> next on the list. Um, but I would say, um, you know, sick kids, Anything to do with mental health, anything to do with sick kids, anything to do with, you know, educational support for, for, for families. Like that's just not one specific place, but just the areas that I really believe in are, are vital. Yeah. It's another interesting question that I ask that always has, like, I find most people I talk to are entrepreneurs just by default. It seems like that's what they are. And a lot of times the answers are very common, which is like, the work that I do, I feel, is the philanthropic work that I'm 
contributing, you know? It's like I pour so much energy into this thing that's intended to transform that the idea of like donating my time or money to outside companies where there isn't the opportunity to really create impact just doesn't even cross a person's mind, you know? It's so interesting that you say that because that's one of the the thoughts I'm having right now about the idea of starting my own charity or foundation is that sometimes, unfortunately, when you give money to a not-for-profit, you don't know how that money is being spent. So if you want to control how it's being spent and make sure that it's being put into the resources that you want it to be put in, maybe you have to start your own thing. But then that begs the question, how dare I decide what's important? So, you know, then then the research goes into, okay, if I'm going to be researching a different chair, like if, if it's not going to be my own, who's going to be doing it with me that will hold me accountable to doing it the right way? And how do I do research and find the right charities who are doing it the right way now in lieu of myself starting something? So it's always asking the critical questions of about those organizations. And, and like, I think everyone who spent time making their money has the right to ask those charitable organizations, how is this money going to be spent? Like as, as consumers, we have a responsibility for where we put our money and that can, that despite the business structure of a charity or not for profit, I think it's still a responsibility to ask how that money is being spent and get a clear answer about it. Yeah, it's such a fun question to ask. <laughs> when I was asked it the first time, I I had a moment of like, oh shit, I don't. Like, I don't really have anything that I'm donating my time or money to. And then I felt this like immediate guilt. And then I kind of reframed the the why behind that. And then I also came full circle around to like, no, you know what? Like my wife and I went through a couple losses and had a lot of support from people at Children's Hospital in Vancouver. And it just reminded me, I was like, oh yeah, I said I was going to support them in any way that I could, but I had this story of like, well, I'm not ready and I can't get my time because I'm too busy and like, well, what's $50 going to do? And the person that asked me the question said, you know, you know, $5 can go a long ways. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right. You know, like it's only $5, but hey, $5 by a bunch of people that are all giving to one cause. So it's it's just such a interesting well, that, one from a when I did when I did the um, children's book ABC Stay Home with Me and all the proceeds went to frontline workers. It was also a struggle. Like, what am I going to? Okay, like how am I actually going to make profit from a book? First of all, that's like a whole conver- that's a whole podcast in itself, um, which we managed to do thanks to our partners who printed the book for free. Who you know, different people came in and helped lend a hand so that that book could result in money to donate, but that was about frontline workers. And that doesn't line up with what I just told you in my answer. Like that's not sick kids education or whatever. It was what was needed most at that time or what I deemed to be what was needed most at that time. So maybe that's my answer. Whatever is needed most at a given time. Yeah. Just having the conversation just brings it to the surface. And now I'm sure you'll think about that this weekend, as will I, right? I always get inspired by the answers that I hear from that too. All right, handful of more questions here. What is one thing that you are most grateful for right now? My children. Why would you say that? They're healthy. We don't have COVID. We're safe. We have a beautiful home. They're, they're happy. They're wonderful. They make everything better. Love it. Yeah. Love it. What is one thing that you're most curious about right now and looking to dive in and really learn more about? (laughs) I don't think you need to ask me that question. Daddy's (laughs) Digest, what the heck is going to happen next? (laughs) I mean, look, I have my big vision board, but there's always surprises around the corner. And I just love, it's like, it's like opening a new book every day. I love it. Yeah. If you can plan and then know that Probably none of it will go that way, but if you can be agile enough, you'll make it, right? You'll create the impact you're looking for. That's why we play the entrepreneurship game, because we kind of love it. That's pretty much it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, last question here. What is one thing that scares you right now that you know you need to meet with bravery? Um, how long can I keep doing this without making myself sick. <laughs> I'm, 
I'm I'm doing a lot right now. <laughs> Interesting. It's a uh, those last three questions are intentionally meant to be like very reflective, right? It's like be grateful, be curious, and be brave. And it's a part of the theme of what I'm doing here. Again, to have my kids and your kids, hopefully in the future, come back and look at this and go, those are really three very important things, in my opinion, for every single person. We should always find something to be grateful in, you know, constantly be challenging and curious about new ideas and and also just be willing to step off the ledge and know that you'll, you'll land in the water, you know? Yeah, and I think it's incredibly important to be honest about you know, I know what I'm doing right this second is probably not sustainable. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to have to be brave and say, okay, Zoe, you can take a day off now. Um, you know, it, it's a funny thing to say, to be brave and take a day off. But I, I feel the stakes are high. So I'm probably a little bit overcompensating because of that. Well, I loved having this conversation with you. I just want to acknowledge you for uh, diving deep into like the why behind what you're doing here. And like we said, when we started this, I didn't know who you were aside from an article, (laughs) you know, Uh, we just knew that we had a mutual contact that said, you should talk. And anytime I have those kind of scenarios where it's somebody that I know, like, and trust and really respect, it's always a good chat, you know? So I'm sure this is just the start of many conversations in the future. Oh, I hope so. I really enjoy talking to you too. Yeah. So how can people find out more about you, connect with you, find Daddy's Digest, all that kind of stuff? My personal favorite platform is LinkedIn. So, you know, Ah, LinkedIn.com slash Zoe Share, S-H-A-R-E. My agency is called Schmooze. You can see it behind me, S-C-H-M-O-O-Z. Um, and then daddysdigest.com. Spell it like it sounds. Excellent. Well, I'll link up all of those as well as this article that I mentioned that I read about you taking over and acquiring this and ultimately your vision behind it because I think it's an important thing. So thank you. Uh, it's great chatting with you. Likewise. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Trevor Turnbull Show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please consider subscribing on my YouTube channel and on your favorite podcast platform and leave me a review. I'd love to hear from you. Now, until next time, remember, today is a beautiful day of opportunity. Trust that you're exactly where you're supposed to be right now. So be grateful, be curious, and be brave.